Okay. Um, yes, anyone who wants to begin um, uh, sharing about their projects, I think it's also important now for me to know where each one is, you know, how over five months. So whoever wants to go first, Sony, Kosto, Shwetal. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'll, I've actually never given a detailed uh, introduction, no, Ishita. Every, every time I just kind of brush it off. So uh, just to give a little bit of a context, I am documenting the Navratri of uh, the city of Baroda. OK, so Navratri in Gujarat is a very big festival. Everyone knows about it uh, all over the world, I think. But a little known fact is that every city of Gujarat has a different way of celebrating the festival. And um, not only that, Gujarat has uh, you know, five, six different regions, you know, four big regions. And then there are smaller uh, sub regions and every place has a different way of, uh, you know, kind of the movements, the songs, you know, they're very local in terms of what they're talking about. Now, Baroda being a, a city and an educational hub, uh, you know, what happened was it became a melting pot for people from not only all over Gujarat, but all over India coming into that city. And there was one a curiosity about the festival. And one is that, you know, all these influences were coming in. And uh, because it was also in a city which was, you know, an education hub, uh, there was a certain way of interacting with this, uh, this uh, phenomena that was happening of people being curious and everything. Now, this is what I figured while I went to kind of figure out what was happening in my city, why did the festival have a certain kind of style, which was different even from Ahmedabad, which is just 100 kilometers away. And, uh, you know, very different from what you see in Ahmedabad, uh, in Bombay, or, you know, even Rajkot or any other place. So uh, that is where my, my curiosity started, my work started. I started researching all that. And this is what I figured that, you know, there was this involvement of people. And that is how this festival evolved the way it did. Uh, so that led me to other things, which is like, you know, where did the influences come from? Who brought this particular song? Where did this particular way of doing, uh, you know, like we have one thing called Ramjaniu, which is which was very peculiar to Baroda, you know. Um, if you know, I mean, if anybody knows uh, what happens in Navratri, the Sanedo, which is absolutely from Ahmedabad. So, you know, there are things that emerge. But again, these are urban festivals. So. There is nothing that's happening in the city. It's coming from outside. So there's this opportunity to go and look at things from the context of the city, but to you know then go into all these threads and figure out what happened, how did this come, and all that. So that is what I've been researching. And um, I made a film in 2000. So it started this work started in 2014, 2017. I made a film. After that, I've had a bit of a gap, like three, four years, where I was basically just promoting the film. And now I've come back to, you know, looking at all the research and saying, OK, how do I kind of put it all together in a way? One is that it's easier for me that, you know, whenever new information comes in, I have a way to kind of put it together. The other thing is that I need this information. The film was a good way to reach a lot of people. But it did not take care of a lot of smaller things that are, that keep emerging at every point. So I need to make this information accessible to people because this is not just history. This is a festival, a living festival, which is morphing, changing every year, you know, and with, uh, uh, with the phones coming in, with so much of media coming in, it's morphing really fast. So what we saw in between the 50s and 1950 and 1990 or 2000 was a very slow evolution, a very involved evolution. Now it's it's really moving fast, you know. So you have you have things where you know people are saying, okay, this is how you should dress up. This is not how you can dress up. You cannot wear sleeveless and do garba. You cannot wear black and do garba. You know, weird things that come on WhatsApp. Then you have you know people who are like influencers, as you call them, who will say we are going to do salsa garba. So you have that, and that could be somebody sitting in Bombay who is influencing the culture of all over the country or the world you know for the festival and then we have this this part you know where we have all this information which is 
uh, detailed, which is nuanced, and which also is very interesting for the people who are participating. But how do they access it? Because I mean, that's what I've been constantly struggling with. Even Ishita knows that, uh, you know, people who are participating in the Garba and who are influencing the Garba and making the change are not people who are going to go to archives. It, it's very, it's very clear. I mean, maybe one percent of them will, but they might even not be the kind who influence. So that is going to be something that I, I really have to work on as to. And of course, social media is one way but also make it very uh, interesting for them to kind of pick it up and you know kind of engage with it so that they feel like you know using it in while celebrating the festival thanks so, um that's really fascinating i think it's uh some of the, the issues you raised are definitely things that i'm hoping i can present on so we can discuss a little bit more as we go through but thanks Ritha. that was a fantastic uh, introduction you. Thank you, Shwetal. Um, Whoever wants to go on next, um, we're just talking about your projects, what you started with, but also where you have arrived at it. So, um, hi, uh, I'm Kostav Chatterjee, uh, a practicing artist and working here in terms of archiving and how can I incorporate the practice of archiving in my practice. So this is my strategy, uh, how I'm working now. So my project uh, yeah, I'm working on is uh, about a uh, few objects which is associated with women uh, in a family. So and in context of marital migration, so how objects perceives and uh, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, transform into I mean, one context to another. So I'm archiving those objects in context of family and uh, incorporating uh, those uh, associated stories with those objects as a uh, I mean as a as a practitioner so I'm uh, producing my work through this so I'm planning for a um, like multi uh, disciplinary or multimedia installation of um, objects and artworks and uh, I'm also working in a like short film so it would be like that I'm planning uh, for this kind of uh, display or exposition so yeah that could be a like outcome of this project for me so it, it could be like uh, displaying those uh, archival objects and uh, few um, uh, artworks and I'm working actually uh, took the uh, material of uh, old fabrics uh, as Gatha which used to uh, like here we I mean women used to produce so this quilt uh, making so i'm working on that actually so actually it's a, a practice of weaving stories so i'm how can i weave stories uh, through those objects uh, actually so this is my uh, focus area for this project and also independently i'm working on another project which is uh, actually i uh, i haven't uh, talked about this here now uh, so that that one is uh, uh about uh, sweet figurine uh, which is uh, sugar toy we call i mean in bengal is called mot and in delhi it's called edri so i'm working on that also it, it's an another separate project so it's also about uh, like uh, local stories and artisanal histories with uh, sugar production and uh, the aestheticization of sugar so how we can perceive uh, in this Okay, looks like uh, Kostov got uh, stuck. Um, I think at this point, uh, for at least for uh, both of you, Shari and Nihar, I think it is important, the way I'm listening to it, just to share that now <clears throat> the projects definitely would have evolved. They would have been working on it. But also there is a sense of uh, doing something with it because we have uh, now a tie-up with both Institute for me to be able to actually have a showcase. Uh, we might do it hybrid depending on if whether uh, all participants are able to travel down to Bangalore or not. But there is a sense of now we will actually have a public engagement. We would have still tried it digitally even if we didn't have a um, uh, space or a venue. But I think having a space will definitely uh, reposition a lot of these works. So this is one of the things I'm noticing that now there is this very strong notion that, okay, what will we do if we were a part of the showcase? So Kosta, I'm just reflecting on how yeah, 
the con- yeah, the explanations are yeah. basically sorry go on yeah, yeah. no no that's fine so uh, yeah so that was another project uh, so uh, it's actually about the uh, like historical context of sugar and uh, the aesthetic purpose of sugar how we are producing uh, and uh, reframing sugar in a aesthetic purpose and also it's a, like uh, i mean outside of museum how object uh, and uh, like object perceives so it's a daily use object like it's we can get it in times of diwali or holi so um, we just have it and it's there only so um, yeah i'm trying to archive and uh, document and make a certain kind of research on that so um, yeah and my research site is here in bengali shantipur navodip and it's actually beside the hogli um, uh, river actually so um, yeah cultivation of um, cane and how it's and also there is a uh, references i mean few uh, literary works are there actually uh, which is about the uh, the fast cultivation of cane is also associated with the uh, bengal region so it's a very uh, uh, so then traveled throughout the world so it's a uh, yeah many time trades and all i'm trying to figure out these and uh, try to be specific on that yeah but here i'm working on that uh, like family archive project yeah. thank you boss thank you i just realized that sony might be in a parallel meeting space so she's not going to be able to talk to us until 12 so geeta ji or shini di do you want to tell us very briefly about your projects sony can you speak with us yeah yeah so um, a year ago i just wanted to you know showcase the old tattered sindhi books that were donated to me uh, by uh, you know daughters of a gentleman who was a tutor um, and uh, they didn't know what to do with his books and they wanted to you know uh, give it to someone who makes meaning out of these books so they gave it to me and i think that was it i i sent it to uh, you know someone who could upload them on archive.org and i thought my business is done but uh, this year uh, with the fresh series of workshops uh, that ishita has been doing i thought let me take it up a you know step further and uh, digitize those books systematically have a you know a dedicated space on the internet for that library so that people can check this information on their own a lot of this information is very hard to come by for example it's very difficult to name one sindhi author or one sindhi poet or you know classics of sindhi literature so what i have been trying to do is figure out a you know way in which all these things can come together on this uh, website so i'm learning about digital archiving i'm learning about uh, at least including some sort of metadata some sort of other you know context setting so that uh, people can access this gentleman's library that would otherwise you know would have just stayed with me that's all yeah thank you sony shinidhi geeta ji no oh, hi can you hear me yes okay yeah so um i am kind of trying to work with my uh, intergenerational archives of my grandmother mother father grandfather most of whom are dead at my mother now so for me the only thing left is these archives to really feel that they're there in it so right now we are exhibiting with ishita at the kluku maka even literally it's like i'm transporting my granny with me or the other day when we did the first workshop at gotha we could literally the suitcase was everything of my grandfather so in that sense i kind of i'm working with uh, these people to understand a lot of things that have happened in the context of our families and mental health fights the drama the good moments the joys and also kind of look at uh, various intersections one of the things that i'm looking at is the intersections of stem and women and queer people in bangalore through their histories which i'm able to extract a lot out of another angle i'm kind of exploring is my recent diagnosis of adhd and how intergenerationally it has come and through the archives i can see archiving as an act of paranoia itself how adhd has ensured that they have a lot of these objects with them clinging on to them so that's another angle i'm kind of exploring and as the end outcome i'm kind of looking at um having these um stem um and 
the gender, the intersection I'm kind of looking at, uh, making a kind of a kit through which you can yourself also explore these um, by yourself as a form of a treasure hunt. I've already put it as a physical treasure hunt now, but uh, eventually I want to feed all the data of the archives, as in the videos, the audios, um, especially uh, some of the material letters and other uh, information that I have so that maybe we can have um, her risk. And one of the reasons I paranoically collected a lot of data was so that we can have them on AI in some form that they can interact with me eventually. So, yeah, so that is something as a project that um, I'm working on and uh, the physical treasure hunt and the virtual AI as the eventual goal for me to have as an artifact with me. So, yeah, that's the goal. This AI bit is new and quite fascinating. It'd be nice to see what happens to archives. Um, so, uh, Shairi, do you want to take over? After, uh, and then new participants can maybe uh, speak with you as we go along. Sure, that sounds great. Thank you all for sharing your projects. They are fascinating. Um, I... Right. So uh, while you pres uh, find your presentation, I'll do a very informal introduction. Um, so very few architectural archives in the country, uh, rather in the region, as you all would know. Um, and interestingly, um, when, when, when I started uh, working with SEPT archives, uh, there were conversations that what's happening in Bangladesh, what's happening in um, uh, Sri Lanka, we should look it up. And of course, we had uh, references of Anuradha Ayer's uh, article about um, the way uh, architect Minit de Selva uh, chose to book, uh, make a book of her archives. And uh, one were wondering what's happening with Geoffrey Baba's work, who is a very established architect uh, from the region. And uh, soon, I think, uh, so this is about five or six years ago when we finally heard that um, Geoffrey Baba archives are being set up. and um where they are now is exemplary in itself um and then of course because of anuradha or other colleagues um i came to know about shairi who's really been the uh, anchor of this project from being an archivist to researcher and a curator um and i think it was much more evident with the last show that happened so the public launch happened last year it's that right is the right way of putting it and it was almost a citywide festival, very tempting for everyone in India also to want to go. I missed it, but there are other uh, options now, hopefully. Uh, that's how I know of Shairi. So I thought this is a nice way to put it that, you know, when you're in the same uh, pursuits uh, and that to uh, just across the border without having to look too far, uh, you always look up to each other's work. And I've been very excited the way you all have uh, approached the whole project. And I look forward to knowing more. So thank you, Shairi, for joining us today. Thanks, Ms. Chitan. It was very kind. And um, likewise, I heard about you in, in very similar ways, probably around the same time as well. Um, as you mentioned, I, I'm just going to share screen. Um, so yes, uh, I'm actually not trained formally as an archivist. Um, I'm trained as an architect and then uh, but I did my undergraduate in architectural history and theory, so there was a lot of archival work in that. And then I also worked on um, Louis Kahn archives at the Yale Center for British Art, which was um, an archive that is about a building. It's about that specific building. So I think from a very early, um, for me, an archive has always been something that's not kind of existing abstractly. It exists in relation to um, some entity or some space or some, it has a um, kind of dual existence, right? Um, so as uh, Ishita mentioned, the Jeffrey Bauer archives are in Colombo. Um, they were set up actually when the architect was still alive in 1982, like 40 years ago. Um, he set up the Jeffrey Bauer Trust and um, he's kind of set up the instruments for an archive. So he set up these goals for once he was no more, what the trustees should do with his, here you can see his house, which has his really incredible uh, collection of art. Um, 
as well as as well as the buildings themselves. So his house, his garden, Lunuganga, which um, I'm sure you're familiar with. And he had a very set, specific set of sort of missions for them about sharing them for the public, about using them for scholarship. Um, uh, but also very interestingly, he didn't set up the um, trust to be about his practice. It was overall talking about art, architecture and ecology um, and to further that kind of work. And in our collections, we have um, quite an interesting but also quite intertwined set of things because we have these buildings, we have a garden, we have um, the archives which uh, include about 5,000 objects altogether, including primarily drawings, but also lots of photographs, letters, documents. Um, we have um, um, the objects, as I mentioned, like the, the art and decorative art um, objects. Then we have samples that he made, and we have a pretty uh, amazing library as well, because he was a, avid reader and uh, collected books throughout his life and so the the books also are interesting because some of them are very much about art and architecture but because he studied literature um, primarily when he was as, as his first um, degree at Cambridge so there's also actually quite an interesting literary library but from a very specific time and um, part of our task as a curatorial team has been to try and weave um, not even to weave narratives around them, but to find ways to look at these objects in relation to each other. And um, just, so as I said, he, the trust was set up 40 years ago, but it took some time for the trust to uh, actually get the resources, the financial resources and the kind of um, infrastructure, like the, the invisible infrastructure of an institution in place to hire um, a curator, which is me. And then within the last five years, we've grown from a one person department to now a six person department. And uh, within that we do, we have, a, it's a curatorial team. So it has three curators, but also design, production um, and programs because the way we see it, there's this kind of back of house um, work that we do as an institution, which includes archiving and collection management. Um, and I think those two words are very key. Uh, and I, I heard it in the way you were all describing, how do you take a bunch of objects and um, take them from storage or from hoarding things into something that is a collection or is an archive? Um, and then of course the the immediate other part of that is what where does that live in the public because um, an archive is by definition something that is publicly accessible and um, you have to have programming or some kind of medium to take that because the thing about an archive is you can never take the whole archive into the public right and as we've been doing this process of sort of um, digitizing cataloging um, the what we traditionally describe as an archive We've also started questioning that, um, is that the right, the only way of thinking about architecture history? And if for us, the purpose of these documents is really to understand, to have a historical lens, to have better insight. Um, you have, for a set of buildings or a set of um, objects as well, when you think about how making happens and building happens in this part of the world, it's not really, especially in the 20th century, it's not heavily documented. It's often on site. It's often, um, there are these intangible kind of ways that, that the process gets captured. And I think the onus of a historian from our part of the world in these disciplines is to try and navigate that. And so we've been looking at different kinds of, um, using this lens of the archive for different kinds of things. Um, including buildings. So the Ina de Silva House, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it. It was um, designed by Jeffrey between 1960 and 62. It was a really, really important project because uh, you guys can see there's this courtyard in this section. I don't know how many of you guys read architecture drawings, but essentially it's a house with this uh, tall boundary wall, which you can see here, which kind of fences off the space. 
it was in a really dense part of Colombo, and he turns the house inwards and you have this fantastic courtyard, which um, is in some ways a very traditional thing in Sri Lankan houses. But he also did it in a way that was not traditional because he did it at the same level of the of the house. The house kind of spills into this courtyard. It's not, and it's a continuation. And that project became hugely instrumental in um, actually house design and uh, the appetite for what kind of houses people wanted post-independence in Sri Lanka. And then um, in 2009, Ina decided to sell it because she was, it was already in an urban, uh, a dense urban spot in the 60s. And by the 2000s, it was impossible to live in. And this caused a huge uproar because, um, of course, people were like, this is a very important house, it's of historical value. And eventually, through um, this kind of public uh, public demand, really, Ina said, okay, well, I've sold the land, but I didn't sell the house. So she gifted the house to the trust. And then within a month, um, this archaeologist called Nilan Kure and his very small team measured and documented. So it was really an archiving of the house, um, the whole process, and took it apart. And the idea was that it would um, be given to the university in uh, of architecture university in Moratua, um, but they couldn't find the land. So eventually, it moved to Lunuganga, and here you can see it in the process of being put back together. Everything exactly in the same orientation, the exact same location. Um, there's now a new there's a new layer in this project's archive because we also have the materials that went into documenting and relocating it. This is Amila Demel, who was the architect who really spearheaded this. Um, a huge moment of truth was when this stair fit back together, the whole stair in this house is structured around this single timber column. Um, and now you see it as it stands today. And um, of course, one of the key things about this house was that it was a, um, urban house and then it had been relocated into kind of rural Benthota and it no longer was an urban house and so in many ways the way we look at it now is as an archive because it isn't the original thing but it's a documentation of something that that existed. Um, we also um, think a lot about how we take our archives to the public because we and when we started this work, as I mentioned, five years ago, we don't yet have enough resources to have it all online and all have full time staff available for visitors. Um, it's something we're working towards. But one of the things we're trying to figure out is how do we in that meantime, take these um, take these collections out and have people engage with them, excite them into studying them. Um, so this is that exhibition I meant, uh, that Ishita mentioned that we had in Colombo last year. And I should say that um, originally the plan was within, so I started working in 2018, between 2019 and 2020, that was Jeffrey's 100th birth anniversary. We were going to do this like uh, very consolidated, very kind of uh, like a marathon of the Jeffrey Bauer collections, the Jeffrey Bauer archives, where we start sharing the material. So this exhibition was originally part of that centenary celebration, which we call Bauer 100. Um, and it was also very much trying to draw these links between the archives and the art objects and the architecture. Um, but then, of course, in Sri Lanka, we had the Easter tax, and then we had COVID. And so the whole thing kind of got um, elongated. But our intention has always been to start with what we have at our own collections, but then to look outwards and look for connections um, across the world, across disciplines. Um, so as I mentioned with the archives, we wanted to show, show them. We wanted to encourage Sri Lankans to engage with them because we also felt that um, while there is growing interest in archives, it's quite narrow for architecture archives. <clears throat> architecture is also kind of a esoteric discipline, right? There's a specific kind of language that you need to read those drawings. And there had been a lot of conversation within um, the trust in sort of um, 
overall levels where people were asking, is it worth us keeping this? Do we have the resources to share this with people? Does it make more sense to give it to a big museum that um, can, um, that will have those, you know, they'll be able to have fellowships and research and all of the, the facilities. Um, and for my team, and we're all quite um, young, I would say, or we were quite young when we started this, um, we thought this was really, it was really important to give ourselves a chance to engage with this because this is part of our history, uh, part of our cultural history, and it's it's quite rare because very few architects of that time actually kept any documentation, um, as with Minette, um, which you guys are familiar about. Um, the, so the other, the major challenge was then how do you take what is a fairly kind of musty um, stack of paper and make this something that anybody could engage with and that was a huge challenge um so we went we were really uh intensely um deliberate about the way we installed the show but then we also had many 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 um public programs to bring it to life to bring different kinds of audiences to engage with it in all three sri lankan languages which is english Sinhala, and tamil um, we did lots and lots of workshops and you can see Anuradha here, uh, panel discussions because we were very keen that while we were showing this um, very carefully narrated story about one set of um, things in the archive that we were always going to make these connections with contemporary uh, situations, with um, with contemporary historic things for Jeffrey Bauer's practice. Uh, and that we were always talking about history because because we're an institution as something with many voices. Um, we also, when we developed the exhibition, developed um, a catalog. Again, with COVID, we sort of split them into two different things. And this book is now available, I think, from March. It will be available in India also. But we're really excited because it allows people to engage with the archive specifically. But it was also important to me um, as the editor to ensure that it was not none of the writers were people who had written on Jeffrey before because it was important to bring fresh voices in. It's not that though we didn't uh, respect or value those who had written before, but we wanted to bring in a new generation of engagement. Um, and they're also very much across disciplines and across geographies, uh, the people who contributed. Um, We've also been thinking a lot about stories as archive because um, I think a lot of you actually mentioned this, that so much of history in general, but I especially think history in uh, South Asia is 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 oral. It's, um, it's through people's narration that we've pieced together how things happened. And so from 2018, very early on, we launched this, um, it's an ongoing series of oral histories uh, where we um, speak to people who knew him, Jeffrey, who worked in the practice, um, who were clients, who were friends. And what's really interesting is that none of their, their stories really add up, which is, I think, a really important um, aspect of history, that it's not always neatly tied together and you need to be able to record and share those different perspectives. Um, we also, so the, the, the recordings are quite long, but then we always do a 45 minute podcast out of it because we look, whenever we have an avenue to share something that's in the archive with the broader public, we try to do that. Um, and then we've also been thinking about Lunuganga, which is one of our really important um, parts of our collection, but it's also, it's a place, it's a collection. We've also begun to think of it as an archive because we've realized that the species that Jeffrey grows, while he has taken um, a lot of uh, aesthetic care about what trees go where and how they're um, sort of encouraged to grow within a space. Um, so he's thinking about it spatially. He's also thinking about it actually, um, I think perhaps subconsciously, and perhaps this is something we're still exploring because um, in Sri Lanka, people have very close relationships to trees and to nature because we never really became a truly urban society. Um, and so 
it's a really interesting collection of endemic species. Um, and with it, of course, comes a whole ecosystem. We, when you have um, a collection of trees and, and uh, flora that is carefully put together, obviously the fauna that comes with that is also, um, it's inevitable. And um, we're still exploring, to be honest, what it means to say that Lunaganga is an archive, because on, a, on one level, a huge part of what we have in the archive is about Lunaganga. There's way more uh, correspondence, archival photographs, um, guest books uh, about the garden than any of our, any of Jeffrey's other projects. Um, we're able to think about it as a kind of studio. So I don't know if you guys know this, but there's this, um, it's not something that Bauer said, but it, many others have pointed out that this hen house that you see here, which is one of the many kind of structures that he made over time, and he made it also at a very specific moment in Sri Lanka's uh, economic history, where we had a closed economy, where you had to show agricultural use for large uh, amounts of land. So he kind of had paddy cultivation and animals so that he couldn't negotiate that uh, Lunuganga was of agricultural value. Um, and many have pointed out that this hen house is actually, uh, it could be looked at, looked at as a maquette for the Sri Lankan parliament, which he designed just a few years later. Through this uh, roof, this, the method of the roof construction, this double cantilevered roof, as well as the frame and infill pattern and proportions. And here you can see that parliament. Um, and, you know, we don't know this as a definitive thing, but you can definitely see, um, you can definitely see that visually there might have been the, a way in which objects at Lunuganga are actually models for other projects. Um, and then, of course, we think about it as um, a botanical archive and we are really trying to we're now working with the with two universities in Sri Lanka to really understand what that means um, um, and as I said there's always this kind of back of house stuff and then there's the public um, uh, side of things and one of the other ways in which Lunaganga becomes an archive is it becomes a repository for invited and sometimes spontaneous art objects that get made for the space in Jeffrey's lifetime. And that we feel is a tradition that really needs to be continued. So as part of the Bow 100 program that I spoke about, um, we did this art uh, series of invited site-specific installations called The Gift. Um, so we had people like Kengo Kuma who were looking at craft traditions and how you can apply them on an architectural scale, which uh, which is very much the ethos of Jeffrey's work, where he would look at something that was being done in one way and then apply it on a very different scale. Um, so it was also a way, it wasn't a direct analysis of something that Jeffrey did, but it was understanding that process. And then we worked very closely with local weavers, local welders to actually make that um, pavilion. We also had, um, I'm just showing you guys two of those installations. Dominic Sansoni, who is a photographer who um, worked very closely with Jeffrey. He's been photographing Luluganga since he was 17. And um, he did this interesting project of looking at the lichen um, on the garden. And that's also interesting because lichen is, um, again, it, it comes through very specific conditions. And what it, what it showed us through that art project was that actually there is a lot of scientific information that we are not tapping, but is embedded within the garden. Um, and then in that installation, we also had uh, a huge series of photographs and contact sheets from Dominic's own archive of Lunaganga. So it was very kind of uh, reflexive in that way. Um, and then we've also been thinking about, um, you know, our situation is quite specific at the, at the Trust because we are um, institutional. Um, there's a very specific set of scenarios that ended up with the Trust being set up, with, with an archive being salvaged, um, and us having the resources to then um, 
maybe not enough resources, but we have some resources to actually maintain and engage that archives. But if you look at somebody like Minette, um, and if you look at Jeffrey, it's a very important contemporaries because they are the post-colonial, in immediately post-independence generation of architects in Sri Lanka. And that um, there's such an important connection between identity, national identity, um, regional identity and buildings. And so we've been thinking about his contemporaries. We've been thinking about the fact that he didn't set us, set the trust up to only look at Jeffrey's work. And of course, any um, historian would look at what's happening around. And if you look at some of these key figures, and we've just picked four, there are many others. Uh, if you look at Justin, Minette, Pani, and Valentine, each of their archives exist in very different ways. And um, I think with uh, Valentine, there is a there is quite a few there's a, um, a substantial set of drawings that have been saved, but that's not the case of Pani or Minette or Justin. But their legacy is still there. There are still ways in which we can study this. And we were really interested in trying to explore this through a participatory program rather than uh, we also didn't feel it would be right for the Jeffrey Bauer Trust to produce or suggest what the archives of these other four architects could be. So we did this through this three-part um, pro process where we did um, a, a wiki editathon because part of the information is, part of the problem was that there just wasn't information you could readily get. So we spoke to people who knew them, who were their family, and just tried to kind of consolidate a first level of information. And this is something we'll be doing uh, every six months now. Um, we did, uh, we also have, started Open House Colombo with Open House Worldwide, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with. It's an amazing um, uh, it's a series of events across the world where different cities will just open up buildings. And um, in Sri Lanka, where, the, where public space is very um, precious and very scant, actually, and a lot of these buildings, because, they, because in Sri Lanka there's been this divide between public work and architecture, and it's a really bizarre situation. A lot of amazing architecture projects are actually not public. And even the ones that are public, are um, they've lost some of their identity as an architectural object because they're so kind of mired in their institutional functions. So what we did was we had two weekends where we just opened, we worked with the owners to open up buildings and just have people visit, and this was amazingly popular and then um, the last program was called model ideas which was a series of workshops where we invited um, I think it was eight groups of participants to choose buildings uh, from this open house and reinterpret them because we were also curious about you know how an archive is anyway only an archive when you engage with it and when you say something about it otherwise it's a doc you know it's a set of documents and we were curious to see how we can make that as open of a process as possible. It was amazing because it also created material, but it was tangible material. Um, so that's just a really quick overview of um, what we've been doing. Um, I couldn't see any of your faces while I was presenting, so I have no idea if I lost you. Um, please, please ask me questions. I can always pull up images again. Um, but I think, um, yeah, we're just really trying to explore ways in which we can both work as a museum because we're very keen to bring up museum professionals in this um, in this country, but also in the region and the training that goes with that. Alongside being, we don't have the we don't have the kind of because we're a new institution. We can really be critical and have. Um, an institutional critique of what should an archive be, who should an archive be for. Uh, and we're trying to sort of negotiate both of those aspects as we find our way through um, through this collection. And just one other thing to say is that um, the exhibition that I showed on the archives is actually opening in Delhi um, on March 17th at the NGMA. So I hope those of you who are in Delhi will be around and hopefully it will travel to a few other cities also. So just um, 
if it's interesting, just keep an eye on uh, social media and we'll be announced on that. Thank you so much, Shairi. Um, I have one uh, just uh, nudge before I hand it over. Um, in terms of the digital space, what all have you guys been able to do? If you could just take us through that, uh, and then I can leave it open for everyone else. Sure. Um, so on the back end, we're actually working on a database, um, actually with Mansi, who I think you know as well, Ishita. Um, and that's been a really long process because um, I mean, I, since you guys are all sort of working, so I think I'll just be very frank about it. Um, the collection management software that we that I have used in the US, for example, is so expensive and the resources are just not, we just don't have those resources. So we, what we ended up doing was finding an open source software that then we configured for our collections. And one of the things we're really excited about it is that it allows us to have the library, the objects and the archives on the same platform, which um, for us feels really important because we want people to be able to study these things as they relate, as they're intertwined, because that's, that is their history. Um, something that is a photograph can also be part of an archive and also part of an object description, right? Um, so that's a slow process, but I think we'll actually launch the database this year. And sometime this year, it will be possible for scholars to access it. But um, the front end is still in development. But while that is happening, and that's a, that's kind of a huge, um, very involved process. But so while that's happening on the on the back end, whenever we do an exhibition, we do a digital exhibition to go with it. Um, we've sort of learned between all the things that have happened in the world and in Sri Lanka that you can never count on, you know, you put all this material together and you just never know um, what is going to happen. And um, we've also realized that our audience is very global. So we um, we never try to make them sort of one to one things, but like we don't do 360 um, virtual exhibitions, but we, we try to bring the content into a digital format. Um, if that makes sense. Um, we also do a lot, I think, really a lot of um, uh, virtual programming. So we'll do lots of Zoom talks. Um, we'll also, whenever we do panels or tours, not so much tours, panels or talks, we'll always record it and put it either as a podcast or a YouTube um, program. So currently, that's the kind of digital engagement. It's something we're really always looking to expand as well. Thank you so much. Um, over to everyone else in the room. Questions, thoughts? Did that sort of make sense or were you, was it like, I'm not, because I'm not really sure how familiar you guys are with these objects or buildings or histories. So I guess I'm curious if, um, if you were able to kind of pass that. No, it, it was quite clear and quite, um, I mean, you, you explained it quite well. So that was definitely <laughs> not the okay. thing. I think we're all trying to sit and think about, you know, how is how are things connecting to our project, I think. Um, yeah, I can understand that. I think um, that's why I kind of included the um, those headings which are just very casually put together but I think maybe um, an exercise that I find helpful is thinking if you had to describe your archive something as your archive what would it be is it a space is it a story is it um, something living is it something participatory is it something personal I think those adjectives are actually really helpful in um, sort of narrowing it down um, should we try that? That's not a bad idea. We could just take two minutes. And if everybody was to fill in this phrase for your project, and it, I think it can also become your um, uh, subtitle for your projects if it works for you. So dash as archives, what, what would you call your project? It's okay, you could change it later on. But yeah. right now, and it could also be more, it could be more than one thing, but yeah. just having that lens, I think. 
Yeah, uh, that's also true, right? So this uh, point would be how many ever dashes you fill up, those many sections of uh, public engagement would emerge. Uh, in the meanwhile, the other question which I had was really to understand the, the idea and the logic of the trust in this case. I'm mm -hmm. coming from a very um, like operational uh, experiences yeah. or challenges that we have faced that who formed the trust? Why are they selected to form the trust? And then what roles do they play, especially for archiving projects? I think it works out a little differently for art collectives or art organizations. I think that's a really good question, um, Ishita. And um, I think it also has a really interesting link to who Jeffrey was. And this is something that we're actually exploring too. Because um, he was somebody who didn't have that traditional um, sort of nuclear family structure, which is how so often things get passed on. Um, by the time he by the time he was in his 60s and 80s, uh, he had friends saying, look, your work has been on a national and internationally important level. You need to think of what happens, like what happens to Lunuganga, which you have put your whole life into. Um, it was also, he pe people say, if, if you get sick, because he had, um, he had an elder brother who had been very ill around that time, who is going to look after you? Who's going to pay the hospital? You know, it's very basic things of, what it takes to live in this world, that somebody needs to be able to handle your things in trust. And so that was how it was set up. And for that same reason, in his lifetime, the trustees were his closest friends um, because they were they were his family, really. And um, but they did have there was, you know, an accountant, there was somebody with legal knowledge because he did realize that these are necessary angles for handling an institution. Um, and uh, following that first generation of trustees, um, the second generation was also largely linked to him personally. Um, but they included people like China Dakwata, who had been his last architecture partner, so he knew the projects and the archive really well. Um, uh, people like Sohanya Rafal, who had been whose father had been one of the founding trustees and like doctor of Jeffrey and but she herself is a um, very established museum professional so she so we actually work a lot through her guidance um, so they they and in this most recent generation we have for the first time actually brought in um, trustees who have no connection directly to Jeffrey but are able to contribute through the through the needs of a trust, and they're all voluntary positions. So they, none of them get, they're volunteering their time, but it allows us to ensure that we have um, financial governance, legal governance. Um, there's a lot of upkeep because we have this architecture part of our collection. Then there's the museum governance. So there's, um, there is a sort of uh, kind of different roles that we do require. And then likewise with the team, I mean, not, none of us, we were very, very young when Jeffrey passed, so none of us knew him. So with us, it really is about hiring professionals and training professionals, which is going to be the future of the institution, right? Um, and I feel like I'm missing some parts. So with the arch I mean, we've had the same question about the archives because uh, we're also a public facing institution um, so we are looking at ways in which we bring in a broader public. We are just launching a youth advisory board uh, to understand how do you get like 16 to 23 year olds to engage with this content and what do they even care? Like what they care about, we can't expect that what we care about is what they um, would want to, to know and that we feel we feel it's important to engage them. Um, and um, I think the thing to say is that in Sri Lanka, because there is no state support whatsoever for the arts, we get absolutely nothing. And also the state is so volatile. And um, so being privately held is actually quite important. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to play out scenarios here for better understanding. So what if um, Jeffrey Bava was not such an important figure as he is. I don't mean important in terms of contribution, um, 
I mean, in an important way, it was possible to have such a network come in and uh, take these roles and positions. In those scenarios, what do you imagine could have happened? Why I'm positioning this question is because a lot of projects that we're trying to build through these programs have been about people who are not known, which are hidden or un unsung stories. Um, they need not have that kind of a network, even if people always have uh, networks or circles, but they might not have that kind of time or understanding to voluntarily participate. And then, of course, we have projects which are deeply rooted in uh, very uh, regional communities. So there, even building a trust uh, would be a very uh, important enabling uh, capacity building workshop in itself. So in that situation, what would you imagine could have happened? Yeah, I absolutely understand your question that we think about that too, right? Like why are we, when you spend so many resources on one person's history, hmm. you have to be able to ask, well, what about? And that's, that was a lot of the thinking behind that, um, the contemporaries program, because it's these slights of chance that allows one person's documents to be preserved and one to be mm -hmm. destroyed. Um, so I think with any archive, you have to kind of go back to the basics of um, who is archiving it? What is it for? Is it, um, I'm actually, um, I mean, I go up to like the institution of the International Ar Archival, is it, it's I ICA, right? That um, they have their definition of an archive. It's like, does it still, many personal archives will, they will be reliable, they'll be authentic. Um, it doesn't have to be a public figure for that to be the case. Um, and I think um, what you need, I think what makes an archive different to a personal collection is that it has some broader significance. And that's why we're also looking at how do you look at Jeffrey's story in a way that is more, that is less about him being this amazing architect and more about him being, let's say, a queer man or um, you know, what are the personal aspects of this? Or if you look at Minette working as a woman at the specific time that she did, um, because those I think are broader and they are actually more universally found. Um, and I think when, I think in the end, all archives also are personal. I and mean, the way we deal with it at the end of the day is like he's a person. Um, and so we have, so I think being able to understand what is specific and unique but then also how that relates to broader concerns, because it always, those themes are universal, those questions are universal. Um, I think that brings in the value component, but in terms of, I think, the kind of operational aspect, I think there are so many, that's one of the reasons we're exploring like the different ways in which an archive can exist, because a archive is a climate controlled, humidity controlled, you know, catalog document is a huge expense and it's not always possible. Mm. But an, a website as an archive is much less, takes much less resources. A film as an archive takes much. So I think that's why we have to be able to think about those other ways. And if you think about Minette and what I'd rather say is the book, which is, you know, it takes that much space on your shelf, but it has so much information. Um, so I think there are many ways. I think just to say one more thing about this the infrastructure of a trust. I think um, when Jeffrey set it up, it was also very much thinking about in, in because in the British system, you have like the National Trust. A trust is a sort of charitable organization that is recognized. We are now finding as we go through fundraising that it's not seen like that universally. So in the US, a trust is tied to a trust fund and we, something like the a word like foundation would have a much more, um, I think in a way it's truer to what we are or doing. Um, so that those words are also so um, culturally specific, I think. This last point which you mentioned was very helpful because I think it's this, while yes, we want to set our own set systems uh, in the region, if this collaboration or exchange with the other side becomes very critical. And at that point, these names or, or at least the format of the setups really do matter. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, avoid trust at all costs. <laughs> but in the country, that's what sells. I mean, it's become mm -hmm. more difficult. Uh, unfortunately, even the word trust has become very difficult to work with. But that's what will at least have some grounding when it comes to not-for-profit work. 
Um, so, and in Sri Lanka, I also, have to see like, whether we have foundation or not. I mean, and what it yeah. means. I haven't seen it enough in detail, but at least having explored ATC or Trust and other or formats, Trust seems like the one which has definitely more grounding, or rather, grounding in terms of security. Um, uh, what because you have a, yeah, you know, it's also what sets you up. Right? If you're a trust, you have a trust deed, which gives you a sort of meant like an entity, um, which is helpful because you need something. If you're thinking about longevity, that can govern you. But um, also, I mean, on a really basic level, like if you're a trust, you can't get a credit card in Sri Lanka because um, that's not it's not a commercial entity or it's um, not recognized. By, so there there are many many nuances to that. Um, but I, I think also what we're realizing is Jeffrey Bauer set up the Jeffrey Bauer Trust without it being about Jeffrey Bauer. He set it up for art, architecture, and ecology. But the name doesn't necessarily signify that. And that's also something we're really trying to negotiate. I mean, I'm so uh, in awe that 40 years ago he thought about these three disciplines. And it was there's like nothing about you must preserve my legacy or must preserve. Um, but it doesn't communicate that in the title. Right. I think even, I mean, I'm presuming that uh, the, just the giving the name itself must have been a, um, a more a bureaucratic uh, concern because yeah. uh, both the publishing houses and the trust, I mean, these uh, centers, uh, bureaucratic centers, they do get into why are you calling something something when you try to register and all so and so forth. So I think making it Jeffrey Bauer Trust would have been easier because he was doing it privately. Yeah. Um, and hence the name. I mean, we realized this when we're trying to give the name for SEPT archives um, and yeah. had to again clarify that it's not only for SEPT and hence for architecture planning and design, but they don't have the system of subtitles or, or a second title. So yeah, that's yeah. the fun part of I this. Think so. I think this was <laughs> it's, this it's was hard to for sure, part of these practices that you deal with a kind of, you're, especially when you're working in a creative artistic practice, but you're still negotiating in a very bureaucratic system, right? And you have to, um, to think through it. Yeah, I think but longevity I of these projects come with the, the need for it to be established. Yeah, it sounds, I mean, from what I heard, it sounds like. Right. Do we want to do, does everyone have the adjective or yes. the noun rather? So uh, we had done one round of very uh, quick introductions, which you could also uh, share what you are doing. And then you can also tell us what adjective you came up with. And then we we'll move on to the rest of them. Okay, so uh, I'm working on the projects of two artists in their 90s journey. Artist Tarba Begum Lipi and Mahabubu Rahman. Uh, basically, it came up with the audio collection of mine uh, on her interview. And uh, I realized that uh, their uh, contribution in their artistic journey is not, uh, it's kind of a way of uh, recognize them as artists, but there is a story behind it. And it's a long story in their academic life, in their uh, initial uh, grooming in the uh, journey before being uh, established as artists. So that's why I focused on this area 90s. And uh, in this session, uh, before this session, I just work on my materials and my vision and focus and what should I uh, want to uh, keep in my project that then uh, now I am uh, came up with a title. Uh, maybe I will work on this title uh, named uh, still star it's under uh, discussion, but maybe I will work on this title Kauchani. Uh, this is uh, the name of Lippi's mother. Um, just to fix my title of the project, and uh, there is a, uh, some. Uh, I, I'm just figuring out now that what should I keep in here. So maybe I will share it if I can uh, give access uh, in the next part of this uh, session or next day. But now I'm in a stable way that I, I will figure it out in here. But right now, you could also uh, do it as if it's a quick response. I mean, by the time you're listening to everybody else, you don't have to answer this as if it's the it's the final one. Whatever comes to you as the first response would be interesting to know. Um, Sony has shared remembering community history as archives or integrating script diversity as archives 
overcoming script constraints, uh, private libraries as archives. And I think the last one is something which is very commonly seen also, isn't it, Shari? That private libraries become a part of archives of certain people or certain uh, genres. Absolutely. Um, it's like having your Google search, but recorded. And it's, I always think like it's interesting because we wouldn't have that today. Like so much of what we read is digital. But the Jeffrey we do actually is like around the garden. We can see all the books we collected about making gardens and they're very technical. Um, so absolutely, I think private libraries are a huge uh, bonus that we can tap into. Especially in cases where we have not been able to do oral histories or interviews because the person is gone. And I think mm -hmm. you very well established why oral histories are needed. In those cases, I found that if we have access to any of the diaries and uh, library books, um, because if the person used to scribble or mark the diaries, mm -hmm. they actually became a second voice to the material. So you could put the library book and some of his archives or his letters or their uh, documents and actually find a dialogue emerging. So yeah, and I think you actually raise a really important point because um, I mean, a library is in itself a different kind of research material, right? A library is something. But then when you make a library an archive, you're actually looking, you're doing something very specific to archiving, which is looking at the, the specific object. Like if it's a book, it's not just every book, but it's that person's book. And like, to give you an example with Jeffrey, he, he never underlines or like, when all my books are like underlined and post-its and everything, but he reads it like there's no sign. But the only clue that we know that it was something that um, was his and that he owned is that he always wrote where he bought it. And if you look at his literature books, you can actually, there's this period in his life where he traveled in Europe intensely, but nobody knows much about that. And we have a set of travel photographs that are like these very um, intriguing clues. But, you know, it's not like also the way we take photographs. They take one image per place. So we don't really understand the sequence. But we also have these, these cities and dates which we can use to chart a journey. Um, we also can see that he just frequently borrowed friends books and did and people told us this in oral histories like i would go to go to his house and take back all the books that he hadn't returned and you know so he was a he was a huge klepto when it came to books but it also shows us then who his friends were and especially when he was abroad because we don't know that as much so there's a huge amount that we can discern by looking at the specific the archival quality of the book as opposed to the library quality of the book if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, uh, uh, for uh, Sony's project, it would be so interesting because these books would have been coming from different people. So sometimes it might actually be the same book uh, being read by somebody in Ullasnagar versus somebody else who has read it in uh, Hyderabad or in Bom even in Bombay or Bangalore. And uh, even if they had not made the markings, as you rightly said, it's also mm -hmm. just the context of the person, where they bought it or which library. They might have not returned it back. And that itself becomes a story. Uh, how much fine must be uh, on their heads by now. So many. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we have uh, Geeta Ji who said oral narratives as archives. And I think that's, again, something we're seeing with many projects where evidences are lost in, and uh, oral history does become the only source for archive building. Uh, in case of some of these architects uh, whom you mentioned, apart from Geoffrey Bava, um, are there uh, evidences and uh, uh, archival materials, or would they be would there be alternative ways to archive? Yeah. Um, so as I said, with only Valentine has a significant repository of drawings, which is the kind of typical architectural archive medium. But of course, because they were all people, they, I, I don't know if that research has been done in great detail, but their families are there. So I think somebody has to go back and look at their libraries, look at their collections. Um, I think I would say they don't yet exist, but they have the potential to exist. And I think at different degrees for each of them. Um, I'm just reading, Shweta, 
what is an e-hail? I don't actually know. Can you tell me what an e-hail is? So e-hail is, uh, yeah, Shudal, do you want to explain it? Or is it better if you do? Yeah, yeah. A halo is uh, basically in Gujarati means let's go. But it's usually okay. said when you are about to start Garba. So okay. there's always like a hey, halo, they'll say, you know, and then everyone joins in. So that's that's a very, I mean, you even say it when you just want to call people to come together. But uh, it's often heard in Garba, even in between, you know, when the tempo yeah. picks up, they say that. So yeah. Uh, that so i mean i don't have like you know i, I mean i i can understand things like uh, oral narratives and all that but i also felt like since i was thinking of you know uh, as i said i wanted to reach out to people who were you know doing garba and not really people into theory and i felt when you say vadla niche garba vadlo vadlo is a uh, is the banyan tree and mm -hmm. the city of vadodara gets its name after the banyan tree so when I say Vadla Niche Garba, it's like, you know, doing Garba under a banyan tree. And mm -hmm. so it, it's talking about the the form, the movements, you know, in some way and how we could be talking about that. And a halo could be about the songs that we are talking about. And uh, overall, I had called my project a full circle project because mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you do it in, in a circular form. But the circle is almost always never complete because you know people come and go and uh, so it's a full circle but without with the missing pieces and i feel in some ways uh uh yeah i can i can see what you're saying movement and festival and performance yeah but i mean i was also trying to think of uh, uh words which would connect to people uh, you know make them a bit curious about it rather than making it i don't know if i'm making sense so mm -hmm. um, you know, no, so the only reason um, I am suggesting other options is because the uh, the the meaning sort of changes slightly. So when you say a halo archives, I can already imagine it as a title. Hmm. But this uh, this underlying statement that we were exploring, the way right. Shuri was explaining, hmm. was more to say what are you archiving? So in a way, yeah. are you archiving movement? And I think I wrote all these three, but I think what you're really archiving is the ephemeral something yeah. that stays and goes away in a blink of a second and how do you really archive that right um and and that when you say it's changing i feel it's it's changed to that microsecond hmm. that in that two minutes of a certain song how i felt or how i performed hmm. or how i danced versus the next song and hmm. the next song when another uh dancer joined me hmm. so that ephemeral how do you archive versus something else so I'm just changing the the coming back to the tonality in terms of a halo or any other regional word would work as a title. I agree with you that it will connect more or create uh, curiosity. But again, for yourself, okay. what is it that is getting investigated would be nice to know. Okay, that, that's the difference. Fine. Yeah, I think it's like less of a title and more of a lens that this word is. It's just like conceptually something. Mm. Um, but as you were speaking, I was also thinking, and I also thought of this when Kustad was talking, that um, I feel like archiving has a whole theory and a science behind it and all of that. But I think there's also a huge richness in working as an artistic practice in archiving. And I think in, I certainly feel in the work that we do that that gets, it's a lot more intertwined than it would be in certain spheres um and i think oh they yeah exactly i think um that perhaps the reason we're even having this conversation is that it's not all institutionalized and it's not all able to fit into but also there are many lives of these things and i remember um when i was in university uh one of the one of the, i guess the things that really influenced me approaching archives in this broad sense was that they had an amazing collection of art books and artist books and zines which are never made to be archival they're made to be um, a lens of something or a way of negotiating some content right but they end up in this um preserved sort of archive situation but um i guess there's so many processes in, like you don't always start with making the archive you start with making the object and it ends up as an archive sometimes um and i think um 
I really, I look a lot to artist practices to understand the full spectrum of how we might um, think about archives and engage with them. Yeah, I think Costa was, um, has sort of closed it with the, with the obvious one also, but uh, something that I think has also become very important to re-emphasize that we're not archiving only for uh, institution building and for um, representation, but I think because we care about something, uh, whatever that something is, whether it's a person or it's a family or it's an event, and the whole idea that uh, care is central, and that's I'm saying that it's also obvious because it feels to me that isn't it all? Isn't it supposed to be central that everything which is done with an intention to document an archive should be about care? And interesting in the word curator, that's there, right? Like it's in the etymology of being a curator is caring, and it's interesting that archiving has sort of lost that connection, but it's absolutely there. It's ab um, and I, if I'm, I know we're sort of close to the end, but I just wanted to put out one more thing to think about, which um, is tied to that, which is to think about living collections and the living aspects of your objects, because I think the colonial archive is so much about divorcing the content from the people, the spaces, the ecosystems, um, and that's the kind of baggage that we inherit in both India and Sri Lanka, right? That that's like documentation. But in fact, it's not that, and it's very much tied. That's why one of the reasons, I think for us, thinking through Lunuganga and the garden as part of the archive has been really important because it's so obvious that you have to think about climate and the kind of ecosystem of keeping something alive. But it's those same conditions that you need to look after paper. Um, and it's the same sort of narrative baggage, right? Like we think all oh, this tree that Jeffrey loved and watched every day when he had breakfast, but it's the same thing with these objects that you can, they are connected to something that had a living presence. It's not like this abstract object. Um, and I think, I think it's really on us to think about what aspects of our, I was going to put this as a second exercise actually, like which aspect of your project is living, um, is alive, and how that changes the kind of responsibilities you feel about it. I think we can do a quick round of it. It does, again, we can think about these questions deeper even tomorrow and afterwards. But if we have these three minutes and uh, everybody just takes 30 seconds to think about one aspect that's living about your archive, and I think this chat is working fine. So instead of muting, unmuting, if everybody just puts yeah. your um, answer in the chat box, it'd be nice to look at all of them and then um, Shairi, you can respond to that and we can take a break after that. So just repeating what uh, Shairi asked, uh, one aspect could be more, which is living about your archive, which is going to be evolving, living, transforming, morphing. I'm sure that must also be the the part which worries you because you, you put it in time today and tomorrow it's different and day after it's different. Yeah. I, I really love recipes as archives because I and they are so when you talk about a recipe, somebody makes that and somebody eats that and it's so sensorial, right? Um so I think I it's a great say after the exercise that we'll be ending with the right point before Neha takes it over to looking at recipes and family and traditions and <laughs> so that's okay. like that how do you how do you look at the living and then still make it more manifested for people to see over the years <laughs> yeah yes uh, i can just uh, say one thing like uh, stories and uh, in in a like intimate space in a familial context is always like evolving whenever i'm trying to archive some stories like uh, how someone came from one place to another like that it's always evolving like one day it's like this and uh, after a few weeks it's changed like it's like not a constant thing so it's it's definitely evolving so it's like studying a human figure which is always evolving moving so it's like that yeah yeah true i also wonder with the projects where you're working with people and like with living subjects I mean there's often so much that you just have to 
hold back actually because they're they may be they might be talking about somebody who's alive and you have to be like, you know it changes the um the negotiation of archiving when because what you archive is for everyone or the way you do it has to be negotiating that i think um and um it doesn't apply i think to everything but quite often you're when you are thinking about your subjects as living as being in in the world i think the stakes are also very different very often with um uh, with all the oral history sessions the more and more of course the intention is to meet the ones who will not be there soon and and hence what happens is you meeting them always in a different state of agility mm -hmm. uh so doesn't matter even if their narration remains the same usually as a researcher or as an archivist your first worry is that their agility will affect the story but sometimes the story is fine but while i'm sitting there i can tell that it was told with a very different uh notion or a very different tone or a comfort level how do i let now the readers of the archive know about this it's so yeah. intangible mm -hmm. that the person yeah. was happier i think that's the simplest mm -hmm. way to put it that between day 1 and day 5 the person was happier now is there a way to communicate that and in that process what i've realized is that eventually one will need to start considering the archives of the archivists um if yeah. that makes sense, yeah. yeah yeah i mean we when we do our histories actually the whole script is under embargo because if we had it entirely publicly um available people would not speak as freely so they that approved edited portion is public but they can specify a period for which because all these subjects are except for jeffrey um are still there and i think that privacy sometimes that's that's part of that archival process that you're factoring in time like you say it like might be over 5 days it may be over years but the way we engage with it will change we have to factor that in yes same here we have also been working with the same logic that one is to give consent for the oral histories but second is to actually consent for the release of it and they can do it in parts and pieces they can do yeah. it with the logic of time that please release this after i'm gone so on and so forth. So yeah, I completely mm -hmm. agree. Yeah. Sony has shared uh, three aspects. One is the literary history, which will be changing the book history, and the script tensions. I think that's very mm -hmm. that's very important. And I think if she was able to share or talk, I, I'm sure we would have heard her explain. Uh, which I mean, we all have, but it would be interesting for you. She's talking about the same script being written from two different points of uh, two different kinds of cultures, subcultures. and yeah. hence how um sindhi as a as a script um needs to be looked at from historical and archival perspectives before one is lost over the other when you say sindhi as a script is it like a dialectical script or is it like a physical script Both. like the visual oh Both. wow yes. that's so fascinating it is yes and that's when the that books the... reflect that that whether it's written with the if i'm correct there is devnagari and there is urdu Uh, or urdu influenced um a portion influence so the the both are written differently is what i understand from uh, sony and hence of course spoken also uh, slightly differently so these books are becoming a reflection of those uh, variations i mean what's really beautiful about the archive is that actually they can exist in tension like that right hmm. which not in all formats they in some formats they have to be like resolved or um you need but an archive can allow them to coexist right medium as i think answered the uh, first question now uh, small incidences as archives i think that's so important mm -hmm. the everyday shwetal is worried about language and context changing every time which um very critical to most uh, community archives i feel no especially mm -hmm. the context bit how do you capture that right how yeah that? yeah Absolutely. okay so me clarified it was porso arabic and devnagri yeah okay so yeah it's just a quick thought uh, like it can be also like uh, practice as archive like uh, so it is also evolving like 
uh, each and every day what uh, an artist is doing it's also evolving and it can be an archive mm -hmm. so you can think of it as uh, like living archive so yeah definitely the process yes uh, the process of, of practice itself uh, would be so constantly changing um i'm just curious just um how does each of you take on a definition of archives like is that part of the project wow very interesting <laughs> Can I answer this? Yes, 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 of course. Yeah, uh, I actually tried. It's been like more than two years that I'm trying to define it, but uh, it's not. Uh, it's at least in my case, it's not uh, possible because it's constantly changing a lot, and uh, I mean, it's not. You know, it's not like a architectural mm -hmm. uh, history or you know it's not uh, woven or it's it, like it's not textile it's not it's not something that you can preserve because even if it is a recipe for example you are just eating it and not preserving it on that on the same day itself you know and you don't know if you're going to be able to make the same flavor again mm -hmm. so Again, like writing a recipe, I think is just like it defeats the purpose of having a recipe. And uh, yeah, it's a little confusing. I'm also figuring it out. But uh, yeah, I'll talk more about this when yeah. we get to. It's definitely yeah, I... something I also. Sorry, Shweta. I just no, no, no. Because I know we're really running out of time. I'm just going to share this link with you guys, which I sort of try and. It's not that I'm strictly bound to it but i try and use it um as a sort of baseline for myself and because the qualities are it's not it's discussed describing qualities rather than something that's very fixed i think i do think that most of what we had discussed would still fit in this definition but i think um it is helpful to be able to establish why what you're doing is an archive and not a collection or not a library or not, you know, another kind of repository. Um, I'm sorry I cut you short, Rita. I just, I, I know it's the next group is here, so maybe I should wrap up. No, no, it's all right. Uh, Shweta, do you want to quickly share what you were going to say? No, no, I, I kind of resonated with what Nihar said because I also feel that, you know, because archiving is about compartmentalizing and even when I'm putting it, you know, like what we are doing right now is like documenting things, it's getting very confusing for me to have these definitions because everything is so connected and so ephemeral as Ishita put the word, mm -hmm. you know, and it's as Nihar said, you know, it's, it's now I can take it on camera and I can put it that way. It's better than you know but but the feeling and the whole whole uh, experience is very difficult to archive uh, and uh, you know even use the word archive for it because yeah. it's not supposed to be it's supposed to be in the moment you know it's not supposed to be uh, experienced afterwards and i think actually what you're archiving is not the dance right it's the documentation yeah. of the dance and therefore if the documentation let's just say i mean i don't think you have i'm very sort of skeptical personally of these definitions and yet i use them all the time because they are easier than reinventing the wheel so it's easier to see if your project works within something that has been kind of internationally accepted right but i think if you say it's a film it is authentic it is reliable it is it has integrity it is usable so actually it is still an archive it, the documentation of the dance is a reliable archive mm -hmm. and it um i think if you if you're thinking about then it as an archive to amplify those qualities like if you if you can't capture the feeling the energy in the film through say cinematography maybe that's where an element of oral history comes in where you ask audience how did you feel there what was it like and you get that as part of the documentation that becomes your archive mm -hmm. yeah. and the same with i think the food aspect just one thing I want to say that in uh, Navratri, we 
don't consider garba as a dance i'm sorry i'm very no, very no, I'm just saying it's, it's just i thought because uh, yeah, yeah. it's always it's always referred to as garba ramwa so it's ramwa is like a game and okay. uh, even when i was talking to experts and they they really refrain from using the word dance so it becomes movement but it's it's uh, not dance so i mean these are little little things that kind of uh, you know put a big question mark on <laughs> what we are yeah. looking at you know, because it becomes a whole thing and the same word is used for everything like garba to sing to do to pray everything has one word garba so the the word itself is you yeah. know Pretty solid. It doesn't what have does the components. Sorry. What does Garba translate to? Like, what would a translation of the word be? Yeah. So it it comes from the word Garb, which is the um, uh, the womb. But the womb also stands for the universe oh. because it's a, it's a creative space. That's so, so it, powerful, right? Yeah. So it, it's all it's all like one. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It's, the whole is one and that kind of a thing it's incredible yeah okay uh, i think this question is still very relevant and if anybody has more thoughts about what is the archive to you you can keep running them in the chat and maybe through the afternoon i mean through the morning by the time we take a lunch break we can still discuss this further after nehar and um, uh, tirupa have presented their bit of taking us into new experiences but this would be a good time to thank Shairi very much for this presentation and the discussion that emerged. Definitely a good surprise and a happy surprise. It was totally my pleasure. Thank you very much.